Oh, here we go. Oh, that's not good. No, no <laughs> lower that. Hi, everyone. Welcome Hi, to Intelligent okay. Disclosure. And uh, I'm Richard Owens, my lovely wife, Tracy. How are y'all doing? Hi, everybody. So, um, you know, we had the lighting. We just changed everything just before we went on. And so now this is what we're going to be stuck with. But does it look yeah. okay to you? I think, I think it's okay. It's all right. Hope everyone's having a, uh, a good evening so far. We're happy to be doing this live with you. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I'll be talking at some length with you about one of the most fascinating and um, I think for a lot of newer people in the field, unfortunately forgotten figure in UFO history, and that is Dr. James McDonald, uh, a brilliant and very tragic figure, very important mm -hmm. person in this field. And uh, we're going to get into that in just a minute. But we had a couple of other things we wanted to talk about. Yeah, like uh, Project Blue Book. Episode one came out. Everybody got a chance to see that. I don't know what you guys thought about it. If you didn't get a chance to see it, uh, the first episode was on YouTube. This is the History Channel's Project Blue Book series. Project Blue Book, for those of you who have no idea, was the Air Force's official UFO investigation back in the 50s and 1960s, and they closed it down in 1969, and they made a series about it. It's pretty good. I mean, it's look, it's it's TV, okay? First thing you got to say. Uh, it features the life of J. Allen Hynek, mm -hmm. the uh, real-life astronomical consultant to Project Blue Book. Um, man playing Alan Hynek is very cool. That's uh, Aidan Gillen, who, of course, was very big with Game of Thrones, if you're watching any of that stuff. Love it. What's that name? <laughs> Just said it looks a little bit like you. Looks up. Well, I offered to do some stunts for the show. So the next time they have Hynek do a fight scene with a Russian spy, I'm like, bring me in, coach. I can do that. I'll deliver the knockout punch. Uh, it's funny because Hynek actually never had uh, encounters like that that anyone is aware of. But uh, they brought that in for the show, so that's fun. Uh -huh. I'd like to see you do that. I think you should. I think you Absolutely. Should sign up for I'm, I'm all over that. I think that's my new calling. <laughs> Um, you know, stunt scenes in yeah. in uh, cable shows, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think I've got lots of training for that. <sighs> totally. So anyway, so the first episode came out. That was about uh, the Gorman sighting of 1948. Uh, actually, a really interesting sighting historically, and they covered that. They, you know, did their own treatment of it. What's interesting, and the reason that we're talking about this so much, is that I'm part of it. I actually am part of it. Mm -hmm. They interviewed me. They interviewed Jacques Vallée. And they interviewed, uh, interviewed Paul Hynek yeah. to provide background commentary, historical context for the show. And it's like kind of putting them in in different places. So they're like it's in the commercial segment or just before commercial, but they're putting it in as uh, ads, I guess, for other shows. Yeah, we heard they're doing that. Uh, yeah. We yeah. left a link. It was on Facebook, uh, but we did find the longer version on History Channel last night. So we put that in our newsletter, and we could probably post it here, too, because it's really yeah. well done. Uh, and Richard was talking a little bit about the actual historical account, so it's really interesting. It's, it's kind of fun to be able to watch the drama and then hear where they veered off. Well, it got us to talking earlier today. So we were actually, I think, in the dining room or kitchen. We were just chatting about this. And... I think we thought, like, why not? Like, every Saturday I do my own live stream. I, right. I do UFOs a big picture. But yeah. why don't we just take a little break and I could do um, uh, one show per week doing a real life breakdown yeah. of the cases that they cover? Like our own little mini series. I think we can do that. So the I, actual historical accounts. So so this Saturday we we would be a week behind. So this Saturday we would start with the Gorman dogfight that was yeah. episode one. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, so. But the actual account. So I think I'll do that. They have an episode on the Flatwoods monster. That's next. Uh, that's, that's coming tonight. up. That's tonight. That's tonight. If you if you're oh, if you have, that's if right. You're able to watch it. Are we going to be bumping into them? They're starting at nine Eastern, aren't they? Or is it 10, ten Eastern? Ten. How about that? So we can go a little. That's nice. So we'll do we'll do this kind of every week. I think that's what we want to do. I, we haven't come up with a name for the series that we're creating, but. You'll find out when we do it. So there it goes. I'm just, I just looked down and we're not going to put it on uh, Facebook. No, we're going to do it on YouTube just like this. And we're going to do it on Saturdays. That's right. Right. We're going to do it on Saturdays. It will be live. So if you're subscribed and you have notifications, you will get a notification when Richard goes live uh, to do that. So, so it'll be like UFO is a big picture, but basically just 
Project Blue Book stuff, and I think that'll be kind of a nice, yes, a nice thing to do for a few weeks. And on Saturday, I will, uh, it will just be Richard, and I will be able to read the chat with Pursuing X, and uh, see what you got, how you're commenting on, you know, the episode or, or the historical account. So all I'll be able to be involved with you that way. All the people who are in love with my wife can wait until Tuesday. That's what I'm just gonna say. Like for those of you, I know that I know you're out there. <laughs> I got my eye on you. I'm watching you. <laughs> so you, it's on, best on Tuesdays. Oh my goodness. I do my own thing on Saturday. Okay, moving right along. Right. <laughs> okay, what else do we have? Uh, so events. We are going to oh. be doing contact in the desert. So people have been writing to us saying, why are you not going? Because uh, Richard has been there every single year. And... Uh, we weren't sure this year, but we are going. We're going. We are going to be there. So we look forward so to happy. seeing uh, whoever whoever ends up being there. It's a great conference. Mm -hmm. yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. I'm Anything else over the week? Uh, I'm doing, um, I've been doing some writing and maybe, I don't want to get into the details of the writing yet, but I'm, I'm working on something right now. And uh, maybe in another week or so, I'll, I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. But I'm kind of engaged in, in some writing projects and other things. So it's all good. Just so people know, I'm still pushing him on the audiobook thing. Audiobooks. audiobooks. We're going to be doing audiobooks this year. Yeah, we have a lot going on. Lots, lots happening. Yes, yes, we do. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. we are busy. All righty. Okay, so shall we get started? Yeah. I'm really excited to hear uh, the story of James, James McDonald. When you first told me a long time ago, I thought, wow, this is really important. We really... It's a, uh, it's a great, I mean, he's an amazing guy. It's a horrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get into all of it. When I'm done, we'll talk about him as well, because I know you've been uh, kind of getting into him the last couple of days. And it, it's, um, he was an inspiration in, mm -hmm. in so many ways, an absolutely brilliant man who uh, for a number of years in this field was just on fire, just mm -hmm. totally on fire. Um, and then things just came crashing down in the worst way in the worst way. Yeah. But his story is an incredible one and it's it's not told enough. There's one really good biography written about him, Firestorm by Ann Druffel, mm -hmm. uh, a very fine book. And there's been um, other work done about McDonald. There's his papers are available for researchers to read. But there's in my view not enough is really known about this amazing man. So I want to talk a little bit about him tonight. And it's really in keeping with what we've been doing mm -hmm. the last few weeks with the Blue Book series. It, it kind of prompted uh, me to think about, let's look at some of the old the old guard of the UFO field. Mm -hmm. Edward Ruppelt, Alan Hynek, Donald mm -hmm. Kehoe, and I think James McDonald. I want to do one on Coral and James Lorenzen. Oh, that's a fascinating story. We were talking about this yes. earlier today. And they, I think that's another one. It needs to be heard because something tragic is at the end of that story. But there's, Absolutely. Uh, you know, I still have hope, and I'm sure a lot of other people will, that something can be done about this. We'll talk about that. I don't that, know if but, that's uh, possible, but uh, it's, it seems like it might be. Well, we're going to get ahead of ourselves, but, uh, yeah. yes, they, they, their library was basically stolen under a very, very deceptive, um, deceptive, um, situation. That's the APRO library, but right. we'll talk about that. We'll get to that in the next, next Tuesday. Maybe next Hopefully. week. Yeah. I'm I pushing so. for that next Tuesday, right. but I think this is great. All the things you've decided to talk about, because there's a lot of people who haven't been in the the UFO field for as long, you know, new, the new generation of people, they're getting caught up learning about some of these key it's characters. It's really true. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I, I got into this field back in the nineties and I was very, uh, you know, very academic about it. It's true. And I encountered writings of a lot of people who were that way, who took a lot of the old history for granted Yeah. stuff from the fifties and sixties. But we're in 2019 now, and it's really true. Like a lot of people who are entering this field, they don't know any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't know about, and and the story of the 1950s, that's a, an amazing story. And it's yeah. it's not ancient history in the sense that it's irrelevant. It's relevant today. And hopefully um, after we talk about McDonald tonight, you'll see another reason why that old history is relevant. It really does matter. I'll probably be a little bit less in chat and a little bit more listening because I, I, I really want to hear Good, the yeah. uh, details of this story. So, all right. All right. So you're going to go I'm yonder? Gonna do, yes, I will. I'm going to go here. I'm going to get myself I'm set up. I think here. we're ready to roll. Okay. Let's do it. Like our fancy system here. <laughs> if, if we were doing pre-records, this is where we'd be the nice, the nice cut. And then I would just slice in. <laughs> yeah. So, but we've got it. We've got it this way. 
anyway, this is good. And um, yeah, James McDonald, he's um, he is someone, I mean, he died when I was very, very young. And uh, clearly I was never in a position to talk with him. Um, but, you know, he was an incredible person. So McDonald was born in 1920. Um, and was at the right age to serve as a young man in the Second World War. But like what this man was about, he wasn't a soldier. He was an intellectual. Got his bachelor's at a very young age, goes off then into the war, serves with U.S. Naval Intelligence as in his early 20s. He's 22, 23 years old. And what he was doing at that time was studying the atmosphere um, using balloons and airplanes. In other words, the science of aerology. And it was how to... Um, basically, as far as early radar propagation, uh, how the atmosphere affected radar and so forth, he was very much involved in the war effort for that. Got his master's right after the war in meteorology, got his PhD at the age of 31 at Iowa State University in physics. Uh, McDonald was very quickly became part of the academic established elite, and for a very good reason. He deserved to be in the elite, in my opinion. He had all the right stuff. He was a brilliant, brilliant guy joined all of the um, professional organizations that there were to become a member of, um, including, I mean, the American Meteorological Society, uh, the Geophysical Society, and a number of weather modification panels. You know, back in the 1950s, uh, weather modification wasn't the, uh, like the horrible thing that people talk about today. Someone's involved in weather mod. Back in the 50s, this was like a good thing. Let's uh, bring water to the deserts and this sort of thing. McDonald was all about that. He was an atmospheric physicist. That was his uh, primary area of expertise. On top of that, he was married. He was a dad with a bunch of kids. He was a family man. He had, he had like the ideal life as I can see it looking back in, at that period of time in the 1950s. So in the early 1950s, he's in his early 30s, he's driving with his wife in the Arizona desert, they see a UFO. And this was what really prompted his interest in the UFO subject. But of course, he was a young academic, he kept a kind of a low key about his interest in UFOs for quite a while. But he was interested, and he wasn't afraid to talk about his interest, he just didn't make a, a big public thing out of it. NICAP, uh, which I talked about a few weeks ago, was formed in the late 50s. And um, McDonald began corresponding with NICAP pretty early on, in particular, Kehoe's right-hand man, Richard Hall, uh, did some correspondence with James McDonald in the late 1950s, excuse me. Uh, and McDonald's talking to Hall, he's like, he's very critical of Project Blue Book and the ridiculous nature of their investigations, which absolutely that was all true. He's very critical of Donald Menzel, the leading scientific debunker of UFOs at that time. Um, but even with all of that, as I say, McDonald kept a pretty low profile with the UFO subject. And then came the mid 1960s. So by this point, McDonald's now in his mid forties, um, and this is when, in the United States in particular, the UFO subject became very, very prominent. Why? The main reason is that UFOs began to be seen in a very, very widespread uh, way across the United States. Just sightings peaked uh, to a very dramatic extent. So in the spring of 1966, now McDonald, he's 46 years old, and he starting to feel like he's becoming very engaged in this subject. And he writes a letter to the chairman of a committee on the National Academy of Sciences. This is a committee on atmospheric sciences. The man's name is Tom Malone. And, and McDonald writes to him and he says, you know what? This is ridiculous. Like Project Blue Book's investigation of UFOs is totally non-scientific. It's a joke. What we need is to have a small body of scientists organized by the National Academy of Sciences to have access to the Blue Book files, all right, and all the related files that the Air Force has so that we scientists can study what they've got. This was McDonald's like great idea of 1966. Uh, he actually wrote a letter to another U.S. congressman on the same theme, uh, Mo Udall, who actually had a long career in Congress. And he said, look, this is what we got to do. And by the way, give this information to another congressman by the name of Gerald Ford. Some of you have heard of Gerald Ford. Of course, he became president 
many years later. Uh, he says, give this to Ford. We want, because Ford was very engaged in the UFO issue publicly at that time. Well, anyway, nothing came out of, of any of that stuff. But McDonald, this was the beginning from him. But what he did do, and this is what really turned James McDonald's life upside down eventually. He received a grant from the Office of Naval Research to examine those blue book files that he was talking so much about at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, it's interesting, the reason that was given, um, officially speaking, was that he could examine accounts in Blue Book of certain kinds of clouds that might account for certain kinds of UFO reports like radar trackings and so on. But really, that was just a pretext. McDonald wanted to go in and he wanted to study uh, the Air Force's Blue Book accounts and to see just how full of BS they were or were they legitimate or, or not. So he gets to go. He goes to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It's 1966. Now keep in mind, there's no internet. So none of this is out there. And, and all of the Blue Book files were really off limits to the, the entire public. The only thing that people had access to back then were these really almost meaningless Air Force end of the year reports that they would send out and say, well, we had this many reports of UFOs this year. We solved that many. And, you know, this was our tiny little percentage of unknowns. We got it all under control. That's all people really got to see. So McDonald goes in to write Pat and he's in the blue book files. Um, and he discovers something. He discovers <laughs> the unedited copy of the Robertson panel report from 1953. I talked about this before and the Robertson panel was the CIA's organized classified panel on UFOs, January 1953. And the reason that's important is that people did not know that the CIA had run a UFO panel that essentially dictated Air Force policy on UFOs for all these years uh, since. So McDonald's realizing like, good God, this is actually a cover-up. You know, in the panel uh, panel's report, it said that the recommendation was to work with uh, media and leading figures in the public to debunk UFOs. And Mc McDonald's thinking, how is this scientific? How is this legit? This is devious. This is un-American. He gets really worked up over it, as was correct. You know, back in those days, people actually believed in the ideals of their society. It's really kind of an unusual thing. You know, a little over 50 years ago, this all was. So for him, he gets, he reads this report, and this is, this constitutes hard evidence in his view of a UFO cover-up. Um, just think about it. You know, for all these years, the Air Force had said, look, look, you know, we look at these UFOs, there's really nothing going on here. We're giving it our best honest effort. And, and then he sees the Robertson panel, a CIA cover behind the Air Force, essentially giving what sure looks like directives on how to do the, uh, how to approach the UFO phenomenon. So yeah, that looks like kind of a cover up. And McDonald got worked up over it. Two days later, we're in June of 1966, McDonald is in the office of J. Allen Hynek. Hynek is in Ohio. He was the Air Force consultant for Project Blue Book, did all the astronomical cases that they would give him. And um, yeah, it was basically Hynek's role. He wasn't he wasn't going out with flashlights in the woods and being chased by uh, Russian agents for real. No, Alan Hynek was basically sitting in his office for the most part, doing uh, some analyses of UFO reports, occasional travel. And uh, he had a nice little gig, getting a paycheck from the Air Force and essentially helping them to explain away UFOs. Privately, Hynek had different opinions about it. Heineck always had a very um, sympathetic attitude toward the reality of UFOs, but publicly he didn't really say a lot. And publicly, a lot of other UFO researchers were always very suspicious of Heineck. Uh, that's a fact. Anyway, so here's McDonald now. He goes into Heineck's office, and Jacques Vallée was present at this meeting, and uh, Vallée wrote about it later. And here comes McDonald, head full of steam, fist on the table of J. Allen Hynek. Wouldn't you love to have seen this? And McDonald says, 
where the hell have you been all these years? I just read the Robertson panel report. You were part of the Robertson panel. This was a cover-up of the UFO phenomenon. This is the CIA telling the Air Force how to proceed with the UFO policy. And how come we haven't heard boo out of you for the last 13 years since it happened? And Hynek really had nothing to say about this because basically it was true. Um, he, I don't know what Hynek actually said to McDonald, but uh, whatever it was could not have been particularly um, persuasive. And the two parted. And in fact, they eventually did make nice about a year and a half later and sort of came together a little bit. But this, it was a very uncomfortable moment, as you can imagine. And um, Valet commented later in one of his books, he says, you know, at that time, you could really see that McDonald was a man afraid of nothing. And this was true. And in fact, this quality really contributed to his downfall some years later. But for right at that time, in 1966, uh, the Air Force was really afraid of James McDonald, all right? Because you've got an atmospheric physicist at the top of his game, a brilliant man who suddenly had gotten very emotionally involved and committed to the cause of ending UFO secrecy, or at least, if not ending UFO secrecy totally, to bringing genuine science into the study of UFOs, which clearly had not been going on. So anyway, so the Air Force at that point just stopped playing ball with McDonald altogether. He wanted to go back to Wright Pat to get a, a copy, a photocopy of the Robertson panel report. They said, nope, not going to give that to you. And in fact, we're reclassifying the report. So it's off limits to you. Uh, get out. <laughs> that's, that's what happened with McDonald and the Air Force. By the way, uh, that meeting with Hynek was a really key moment in um, Hynek's, uh, I guess we could say, public conversion on the matter of UFOs. It was the one-two punch. It was the Michigan swamp gas uh, kind of fiasco, which I talked about when we discussed Hynek a couple of weeks ago, uh, where he really kind of looked silly talking about decaying vegetable matter as a cause of UFO sightings. The whole country started laughing. But then here comes McDonald, fist on the table, and really driving home this point of essentially intellectual integrity and, and scientific integrity. And so as a result of this, Hynek that summer wrote, uh, I think his first major public article for Science Magazine, pretty prestigious, um, which just stated that the Air Force did in fact have a lot of unexplained radar reports and photographs of UFOs. And he said, look, we really need to stop uh, ridiculing witnesses and so forth, and and just said, you know, honestly, this is Hynek now being influenced by McDonald. He said, there's really never been a true scientific investigation of UFOs, which was a direct slap at Project Blue Book, which of course was pretending all these years that that's what they were doing. Anyway, um, a little bit of context before I talk about this next phase of James McDonald's life. 1966, all right, this is a year of very significant UFO activity. Every bit is big, if not bigger than the year 1952, which a lot of folks know about. 1966 had equally the, that amount of, of very, very dramatic encounters, both civilian and military. All right. So the Air Force was kind of dealing with this as a problem, and they were also dealing with this as a public relations issue because they had Project Blue Book. The public is looking to Blue Book to uh, answer their questions about UFOs. So think about it from the Air Force's point of view. You've got this phenomenon that in reality, you're completely incapable of dealing with and you know it. And you're never ever gonna admit this to the world or to the public, all right? So you've got this joke of an operation, Blue Book, that's about pretending to investigate UFOs. And it was a real problem because people were starting to realize, people like McDonald and now Hynek, were openly critiquing Blue Book as essentially a joke. This was a real problem from the Air Force's point of view. It was a real PR nightmare. So they were at a dead end, the United States Air Force, with this UFO thing. And they needed to get out of this connection to UFOs come hell or high water. They had been wanting to do this for years, and they just hadn't been able to find a way to do it. In the summer of 66, Jacques Vallée, 
talked about having heard rumors in Europe in 1966 that the U.S. Air Force wanted some university to give a very quick look, not a deep look, a quick look at the facts of UFOs and give some kind of negative conclusion for the Air Force. So the word was already out uh, to people with, you know, with their ears ready to hear. Um, so this is all happening in the midst of all of this massive UFO activity. Incidentally, another relevant part of this story is the entrance of a fellow named Philip Klass to the UFO scene. In August of 1966, Philip J. Klass published his first debunking piece on UFOs for the publication he worked for, which is Aviation Week. Um, it was a ridiculous, uh, a, a absolutely ridiculous article explaining the 1965, just a year earlier, Exeter, New Hampshire case, as some kind of weird plasma discharge from a power line, basically ball lightning. It's a total joke. I mean, a massive WTF moment from all genuine researchers and scientists who understood the phenomenon. But it's an interesting thing about Class. The New York Times loved him. They loved Philip J. Class. And he immediately is anointed, essentially, by the media as this instant authority on UFOs. It's really an amazing thing. You can almost see this as a coordinated effort. And in the context of something like Operation Mockingbird, which I love to talk about and everyone needs to know, you need to know about this. Mockingbird was the CIA's coordination with mainstream media to manipulate American news. All right. So I've always believed that the UFO phenomenon was part of the Mockingbird system. So here's class gets instant credibility from the New York Times for a ridiculous explanation of UFOs. Anyway, uh, it's relevant here because McDonald reads Class's uh, expl explanation for that case, and he just tears it to pieces. Because look, McDonald's is not an, at an astronomer. He's an atmospheric physicist. And that's the true expertise. Like, why is it? Have you ever asked yourself, like, why do we accord astronomers some kind of instant authority when it comes to UFOs? They have, they have no more expertise in studying UFO reports than a bricklayer, frankly, or a plumber, in my opinion. Being, I mean, maybe one out of 100 cases or one out of 50 cases might have an astronomical explanation, you know, sightings of the planet Venus. Okay, sure, fine. But here's the thing. James McDonald wasn't an astronomer. He was an atmospheric physicist. And where are UFOs generally seen? In the atmosphere. It's a big difference. And so McDonald looks at Class's explanation and tears it to pieces. And he ends it, he writes, Class dismissed. That's like drop mic moment right there for James McDonald. A great little pun. Class, I'm sure, hated that. Um, so what was interesting is that Philip J. Class soon left ball lightning far behind as his means of explaining UFOs. And he went on uh, to more traditional means of debunking basically character assassination and ridicule. And his first target would be James McDonald. But before that gets going, uh, everything's moving really fast in 1966, and McDonald is at the center of it, all right? So the Air Force is trying to unload UFOs. They find their university to help them do it. It is the University of Colorado at Boulder. They find physicist Edward Condon, who's a highly respected uh, academic physicist, and he's going to run the program. He has a, a number two guy there, Robert Lowe, who I have argued uh, many times was a CIA operative uh, really working on behalf of the agency for this program. So they get the, uh, the contract during the fall of 1966. It's announced in October that they're contracting with the Air Force to do uh, a scientific study of UFOs. And their words were a serious, objective, scientific, and independent study. And in fact, as it turns out, they did absolutely none of those, like none of those adjectives applied. It was not serious. It was certainly not objective. It was not scientific and it was not independent. Um, 
But at the moment, everyone was happy, including McDonald. They thought, okay, great, finally, because wh whatever these academicians do, it can't possibly be as bad as what the United States Air Force has been inflicting upon us for all of these years. And so the initial moment was great. Let's see what the University of Colorado can do here. Well, it very quickly became obvious through some of the re really juvenile statements of Edward Condon himself that this was not going to be an independent or a, um, a serious study of UFOs. But this is the thing about McDonald, all right? So in October of 66, he kicks it up into high gear. All through that year, all through 1966, James McDonald had been studying the old UFO reports and interviewing dozens and actually, I think, hundreds of witnesses. Um, and you have to understand, like, this was unprecedented for a scientist of such world-class stature to be doing this as what James McDonald was doing. His analyses of these older cases utterly laid waste to the conclusions of people like Donald Menzel or people like Philip Class or the Air Force. And um, this is why the Air Force feared James McDonald. Um, I think the word they called him was uh, an outstanding nuisance at one point. So now uh, in early October, when the Colorado project is announced, McDonald takes this opportunity and he hits up the media in a big way, talks to reporters, He's talking to a, a forum at his University of Arizona several different times, and he's giving his views openly now on the reality of UFOs. It's like he's basically coming out here. And he's talking about the cover-up as well. Um, and in the, his faculty members, some of his friends said, uh, you better be careful, bud. This is very professionally risky, which, of course, it absolutely was. Um, the day after the Colorado project was announced, he goes, McDonald goes to reporters and talks publicly about the Robertson panel report, which he says, look, I saw this report and I read it at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and the CIA is uh, basically ordering the Air Force to debunk UFOs. So now it's really starting to come out. All of this was new information at the time. And then just a couple of days later, still in October, he speaks to the uh, American Meteorological Society meeting. He's in Washington, D.C. And this is explosive. And I have what he says right here. I want to read you these words of James McDonald. He says, my study of past official Air Force investigations, this Project Blue Book, leads me to describe them as completely superficial. They have for at least the past dozen years, been carried out at a very low level of scientific competence. Um, and he goes on, officially released explanations of important UFO sightings have almost been absurdly erroneous. Um, you know, basically saying there's almost never been any on-the-spot investigations, uh, very superficial, uh, even though all the official press releases by the Air Force are trying to give the impression that uh, they're handling this scientifically. He says, in fact, there has not been any significant scientific investigation of these UFOs. So he's really just throwing down the gauntlet. He uh, takes the initiative and goes to Colorado to talk to the team at Boulder that was just put together to study this UFO project. And uh, most of the, the people involved, and they, these are all professors, at the University of Colorado, by and large, they're happy to meet with him. Condon was not happy to meet with him. Robert Lowe was not happy to meet with him. But the actual investigators here thought, great, James McDonald, absolutely. And he explains some complexities of radar to them and mirage effects and whatnot. And then he says to them, listen, the time is going to come for all of you when you find yourselves confronting astonishing evidence of mishandling of the UFO problems by your sponsoring agency, in other words, the Air Force, which gave them the contract. He said, you're gonna see all this evidence that they have absolutely blown it. And he was in a great position to say this because he had analyzed all that evidence at Wright-Patterson just a few months earlier. Um, so that's McDonald. And again, um, you know, but of course, Condon wanted nothing to do with any of this. 
Um, because of McDonald's pressure throughout that year, the uh, Robertson panel report actually was released, uh, at least segments of it, later in 1967. And that absolutely was due to James McDonald's pressure. And as a matter of fact, the same year in 1967, the uh, Air Force released the contents, and this is really quite amazing, of the famous memo by General Nathan Twining, which if you follow UFO history, this is a very, very big deal from 1947. Um, in other words, the Twining memo came out a full decade before the, most of the documents that we now have through Freedom of Information. Um, and I don't know that McDonald's pressure led to the direct release of the Twining memo, but I suspect that at least indirectly it was part of the um, part of the reason. Anyway, when the Robertson panel comes out, the, all that that paperwork, in other words, related to it, Condon, um, what what a terrible, terrible leader of a scientific program this guy was um, related to UFOs. He sees the Robertson panel report and he says, this is meaningless, doesn't mean a thing. Um, it wasn't any, it wasn't even a scientific report, so who cares? And of course, avoiding the significant questions as McDonald was raising about the Robertson panel, like was CIA actually running UFO policy? That's an important question. Why was its connection to all of this stuff hidden? There's another question. Um, and if this was a meaningless report, why did you have all these Nobel caliber scientists involved in the Robertson panel that's being used as the basis of UFO policy to this day? Anyway, um, things got even crazier though. This is just still building up. So there is something known as the Lowe Memo. I mentioned the name Robert Lowe, and I've in fact talked about the Lowe Memo in a couple of previous um, live streams, most particularly when I talked about the Condon Committee. Uh, but Robert Lowe, I'll just recap real briefly. Robert Lowe was a number two person at the uh, University of Colorado project for on studying UFOs. And uh, so a memo was discovered in the file cabinet by one of the professors and one of the people involved in the Condon Committee. And uh, and it was a memo that wrote that Lowe had written before they accepted the contract from the Air Force. And essentially he's laying out like why they might want to accept this Air Force proposal. And he says, but the thing is, the trick will be, we have to appear willing to do it, but in such a way that all of our scientific colleagues realize that we have no expectation of finding anything, finding a saucer, he says. So in other words, um, and it was sometimes called the trick memo because he used the, used the word trick in there. But really what became obvious is that this was not um, a project that the university entered with a genuine, uh, wanting to make a genuine effort to get to the bottom of UFOs. So they were obviously much more concerned about public relations and just going through the motions, essentially, of looking into UFOs. So this memo is discovered by the people, the scientists involved in the project, and a couple of them, like they actually said later, it made me feel sick to my stomach. Um, so for much of 1967, it's just circulating throughout the project, and it really led to uh, a lot of decrease in morale. People started to realize Lowe had no interest in the UFO phenomenon. Condon had no interest in the UFO phenomenon. A lot of these scientists involved in the committee are thinking, why? Why the hell are we even doing this? We're, we are clearly just going through the motions. So all of this discontent is, is floating through the staff and it gets to Donald Kehoe, the head of NICAP. He learns about the Lowe memo and Kehoe then tells McDonald. So by the end of 1967, McDonald is back in Boulder. And in fact, he's there to make nice with Hynek. Uh, the secretary of the project was a woman named Mary Lou Armstrong, and she arranges the two of them. She says, look, look, we really need both of you to be helping us here with this because this project's not going well. So McDonald and Hynek, they kind of work things out apparently. And McDonald <laughs> says to her, Oh, by the way, uh, so what's the deal with this memo by Robert Lowe? And her face just goes white, apparently. 
and other staffers, other people involved in the project, like realize like, oh no, no one else is supposed to know about this. So McDonald knows and they decide, all right, there's a scientist named David Saunders, uh, Norm Levine and a few others that are there and they decide to give McDonald a copy of the low memo. It's at the end of 1967. And, and this is what causes everything to explode. So now here's McDonald, he's got this memo. It's like a nuclear bomb because you have to understand McDonald has what really looks like proof of the duplicity of this University of Colorado project that's supposed to be investigating UFOs fairly. And it's very obvious through this memo that they were not attempting to do it fairly. So this is a real problem. So McDonald goes off to Australia. He's uh, got a, another grant from the Office of Naval Research and uh, to do research there on uh, clouds and atmospheric uh, phenomena. But he also said to Lowe previously, say, well, I'm in Australia. Uh, I'm gonna probably do a little UFO research and maybe give a lecture or two. Lowe leaked that information to Philip Class on McDonald's trip to Australia. And Class begins this letter writing campaign to destroy McDonald. Writes to ONR, he says, did you authorize James McDonald's UFO research? Uh, Office of Naval Research says, look, you know, we're very happy with McDonald's work but they were afraid of class because he wrote for Aviation Week and could embarrass them, you know, with all of this UFO smearing. And so this is really a process of intimidation that, that uh, the reprehensible Philip J. Class initiated against James McDonald. And it worked, by the way, because ONR never gave McDonald another grant. Uh, it looks like they probably would have, and that was the end of McDonald's grant money from Naval Research. So, um, and Class just continued to go after McDonald. He called him like, a habitual liar, all of these other untrue things uh, by way of smearing. But this leads to the crisis. Ma uh, McDonald is armed, really, with this Lowe Memorandum by Robert Lowe. It's like a bomb ready to go off, and the only question is when. So at the end of January 1968, McDonald writes a long letter to Robert Lowe, seven pages, tight, single space. That's a long letter. And it's mostly an extended analysis of everything that he believes is going wrong with the University of Colorado's project on UFOs. And then midway through, he mentions the memo. He says, yeah, I was rather puzzled by the viewpoints uh, expressed in there, although I assume they must be totally straightforward to you. Uh, and he emphasized too, look, this was in the open files of the project. I didn't steal anything. It was right there. Uh, and he said, uh, he, it was, he, he was very, very deft in his handling of this. He said, look, I'm not opposed to negative findings on UFOs, but it's actually not too cool if you've got a negative conclusion before you even begin your analysis. Like that's not scientific. And, um, uh, so anyway, he sends it off very cordially, James McDonald and, in the words of Mary Lou, March, Larry, Mary Lou Armstrong, she just said, Bob exploded. Um, all through early February on one day, there's just meetings in Condon's office all day long. How did McDonald get this letter? Uh, several staffers got fired that day. Um, and the, the, quite a few people left the Condon Committee program as a result of this. Uh, McCondon was furious at McDonald. He called them treacherous. He called him a thief. He stole the memo. None of that was true. Condon actually had a mild heart attack uh, right after this all happened. I'm sure the stress of all of what McDonald was doing was a major contributor to this. All this is happening while the University of Colorado Project is supposed to be wrapping everything up and far from it. It was just a complete mess. In the midst of all of that, McDonald in the middle of 1968, delivered what is really one of the greatest presentations, um, I would say, that any person in the UFO field has ever given, all right, ever. Um, for many years, NICAP had been trying to get uh, the U.S. Congress to have a kind of open hearing on UFOs. Uh, McDonald had recently been pushing for this. And so by the summer of 1968, 
these efforts actually succeeded for one day on July 29th, 1968. The House uh, Science and Astronautics Committee had a symposium on UFOs, kind of a big thing. Um, a lot of the major figures in UFO research were invited to testify for Congress. Hynek was there, McDonald was there, Carl Sagan was there, uh, others as well. Even uh, Donald Menzel uh, was allowed to submit a paper, uh, although he didn't give testimony, but McDonald dominated it. There were no criticisms allowed of the Air Force or of Blue Book or of the Colorado Committee. Uh, that was one of the rules they laid out. So they all go in and they present, and McDonald though was, he was the man on this event. Absolutely, no question about it. Um, he's got 30 pages of verified UFO reports of 40, 42 in total. And here's some of the things that he said here. He says, I have become convinced that the scientific community, not only in this country, but throughout the world, has been casually ignoring as nonsense a matter of extraordinary scientific importance. My own present opinion, based on two years of careful study, is that UFOs are probably extraterrestrial devices engaged in something that might very tentatively be termed surveillance. Uh, I believe no other problem within your jurisdiction is of comparable scientific and national importance. These are strong words and I intend them to be. He goes on that said he'd interviewed several hundred witnesses in selected cases. And he said, and I am astonished at what I have found. I had no idea, he said, that the actual UFO situation is anything like what it appears to be. But um, that was McDonald, and it was an amazing statement, but I mean, the hearing really had no impact um, on society at large, frankly. And then it was just basically a legacy, and it's a legacy for you, it's a legacy for me, it's for us. But uh, for the time, it, it just basically dropped, and that was the end of it. Uh, and then in the immediate aftermath, the Condon committee was just wrapping it up, wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. Condon's like, he's got a whole new team of people there because he fired much of the original team and they just cobbled this report together. You ever try to read the Condon committee report? It's uh, not an impressive document. It's mostly padding, to be honest with you. But anyway, Condon writes his conclusion at the end of 1968. He says, UFOs, he says, are of no probative scientific value. What does that mean? He says, basically, if you study the phenomenon, uh, science is not going to benefit. There's just nothing scientific that we are going to get out of it. Their Air Force, therefore, should drop Project Blue Book, and that's all the Air Force wanted to hear. Um, and that's the hammer falling down. But McDonald and Kehoe and Hynek and some others, one of the project members, David Saunders, uh, they were all very publicly critical of the report, but it made no difference, made no difference. Um, interesting thing, McDonald even tried to get copies of the Blue Book files from that the project had used, so the Colorado project that had copies of Blue Book files. And again, keep in mind, like these files are like gold to a UFO researcher. They were not publicly available, but the Colorado committee had them. And McDonald made an effort to get them, did not work. Condon made sure those files were destroyed. So it's like end of story, UFOs are debunked. But there was one final gasp statement. It was an amazing final statement. I mean, an incredible final like summation by James McDonald of this phenomenon. And it came the day after Christmas in 1969. So a full year after the Condon Committee made their conclusion, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, invited Hynek and McDonald and Carl Sagan and Donald Menzel and Thornton Page and a number of other big shots in the field at the time to speak at a symposium on UFOs in Boston. Can you imagine? Now, why did they do this? Well, in fact, they had planned to do this more than a year earlier, but it was agreed to delay that uh, so as not to um, have any bearing on the University of Colorado's conclusion or some reason like that. So they do it a year later. So McDonald goes, Hynek goes. Um, and once again, I mean, there's no question about this. James McDonald simply dominated the proceedings here. Um, and he delivers a paper. It's called Science 
in default, science in default, subtitled 22 years of inadequate UFO investigation, really lays it out. And in my view, this actually is the, the true uh, tour de force by James McDonald, because here he's not just speaking to Congress, he's speaking to his scientific colleagues and peers. And he's essentially, <laughs> he's condemning them not condemning them morally, but intellectually, scientifically, basically stating to them, you have had this opportunity to investigate this incredible phenomenon and you have failed. And this is what McDonald says, a couple of his statements that I've just, um, I'm repeating here for you. No scientifically adequate investigation of the UFO problem has been carried out during the entire 22 years that have now passed since the first extensive wave of sightings of UFOs in the summer of 1947. So has not been done. All right, he's speaking again to these scientists. The UFO problem, he says, far from being the nonsense problem that it often has been labeled by many scientists, constitutes a problem of extraordinary scientific interest. So again, Scientists are saying that there's nothing here. It's actually an extraordinary scientific issue. And he says mainstream scientists have just been complacent for not recognizing uh, separating the good report reports from the bad. He says it's easy to make fun of the bad reports. That's just creating straw men arguments. There's genuine signal in that noise. And he says, and scientists have essentially been lazy in not looking for that signal. And he said, furthermore, We've all been lulled, or our society has been lulled into this thought that, oh, the Air Force actually knew what it was doing. And he says, nope, Air Force has had no clue. They've been conducting their investigation with utter incompetence, absolutely incompetent, he says, which makes it very dangerous. This idea that there's been some kind of solid scientific study of the UFO problem, he says, no. The investigations that have been done hitherto have been scientifically meaningless, he says. So this was a direct hit at a few things, uh, a direct hit at the Robertson panel, including Thornton Page, who had been a member of the Robertson panel. He was sitting right there in the audience. Uh, and the Condon Committee as, as well, which he said was quite inadequate. That was his word for that. Uh, padded with fluff, uh, but unable to hide the fact, he said, that it studied only a tiny fraction of the truly difficult UFO reports. He says this level of argumentation was wholly unsatisfactory. Um, and again, he says it's really dangerous when we have this idea that we think science has really investigated UFOs. It's the biggest obstacle that we're gonna have, he said, in making real progress, but he says, because it hasn't investigated UFOs. And he said, furthermore, which you know many of us have said ever since, about a third, he said, of the Condon Committee cases were unexplained. How, can, how could Condon state that further study of UFOs couldn't be justified? You can't, couldn't explain nearly a third of the cases in your own report. Anyway, that's the Condon Committee. And then finally, McDonald goes after the National Academy of Sciences itself. And to me, this is actually the most damning statement uh, of this particular speech. He says that a panel of the National Academy of Sciences could endorse this study is to me disturbing. I find no evidence that the Academy panel did any independent checking of its own and none that none of that 11 man panel had any significant prior investigative experience in this area to my knowledge. And what else do you say to that? It was all absolutely true. The thing is there was no one else like James McDonald. He was a first rate scientist on a mission afraid of nothing, able to say precisely what he meant. Not a lot of people like that. But the thing is, James McDonald by himself, like he couldn't turn the situation around and he knew it. You know, you read this statement of his and you really get the feeling he wasn't really speaking to these people. I mean, he was, but he was really speaking to posterity, to those, to you and to me and to those of us years later who could have the ability, I think, to see the situation with a bit more clarity. I think he was speaking to us. Well, it wasn't long after that that James McDonald's life ended. 
uh, at the age of 51. Now, here's the thing. As far as anyone could tell, McDonald was fine uh, throughout 1970 and into 1971. On March 2nd, 1971, he testified as an expert in atmospheric physics uh, before Congress. This is a, relating to something known as the supersonic transport. It was called the SST. This was a big thing at the time in the early 70s. It was a supersonic uh, commercial uh, aircraft and it was going across Atlantic. And there was a lot of um, controversy about it and concern by residents about uh, sonic booms and any other environmental harmful atmospheric effects. So McDonald, as an expert in the atmosphere, is brought to Congress and he's there to testify on this. That's nothing to do with UFOs. But the opponents of McDonald relating to the SST, of course, as you could expect, use the UFO um, phenomenon to uh, ridicule him. And, um, and that's what they did. They said, this is someone who believes in little men flying around the sky and just ridiculed him. And several times during his testimony, laughter broke out. Um, I mean, just a ridiculous sort of a situation that was allowed to happen in the U.S. Congress. So shortly after this incident, James McDonald shot himself in the head and did not die. He became blind. It was horrible, a horrible thing. Uh, he was committed to the psychiatric ward of the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona. And he's there for a while. And then in June of 1971, he signed himself out. So on um, a Sunday morning, June 13th, uh, it was just a horrible situation. There was a woman in South Tucson. She identified herself as a doctor. She makes a phone call. She says, there's this deranged blind man. He's taken a cab to this area. She wanted to know where the driver had dropped him off and she's making all these phone calls. So someone had noticed McDonald. Meanwhile, a married couple and their children, they're walking along a little shallow uh, creek, find the body of James McDonald. He's under a bridge. It's uh, not long before noon on June 13th. There's a 38 caliber revolver uh, in the sand near his head. Uh, a brief note attributed his suicide to his marriage, which was in trouble, and to family, family problems and, and the like. So that was James McDonald, died June 13th of his second suicide attempt. So, um, you know, I wrote my first book, uh, UFOs and the National Security State, about 20 years ago, almost. And in that book, I did speculate whether James McDonald truly committed suicide or was he suicided. Now, I would say it's very likely that he did commit suicide. I would think that's really the best uh, explanation that we have. Most UFO researchers will agree that that is the case. Uh, his official biography certainly says that. But I just want to point one thing out here, all right? Um, by the early 1970s, even sooner than that, there were many intelligence agencies that were skilled in creating suicides, all right? I'm not saying that this happened to McDonald, and I actually personally don't think that it did. Although the fact is we really can never know. You have to ask, how severely had James McDonald's mental condition deteriorated? You know, this is a absolutely brilliant man who was at the top of his game professionally. Um, and you could also argue that, you know, the whole UFO thing was not a depressing situation. I mean, it had made him famous. It had given him a tremendous uh, I wouldn't say tremendous, but a significant number of people who were really great admirers of him. And he knew this. Um, and he might, he was certainly intelligent enough, I think, to take the long view of UFOs and realize that simply because the Condon Committee tried to debunk it, the phenomenon was not going to go away. And uh, there were many more years that he would have had. He was only 51 in which he could have been analyzing and, and talking about this issue. Um, married, bad marriages happen and they can be depressing. There's no question about it. But is this why he would have killed himself? Was it the embarrassment in Congress over the SST hearings 
that's a reasonable supposition. But to me, anyway, all of these feel like something's miss, missed here. Now, again, I'm not in any better position, really, to talk about this than you are, frankly. I didn't know James McDonald, and I was just a kid when uh, all of that happened. But um, I do think it is, it's dishonest not to recognize the technologies that existed even then to destabilize someone mentally and destabilize their mood. Uh, by that time, for example, there was already pocket size transmitters that could generate electromagnetic energy, EM radiation, at um, low enough levels that could do the job of destabilizing uh, your mental faculties. Uh, in fact, in 1972, uh, just a year after, there was an expert who testified in Congress on exactly this technology, talking about the use of EM weapons, uh, used for mind control and for mental disruption. The capabilities were there, and you could easily see McDonald being considered, even in 1971, a threat. I'm not saying he wasn't, uh, I'm not saying that they did kill him, but I am saying that we do not know. Nobody knows what really happened behind the scenes with James McDonald. Yeah, he probably pulled the trigger, but was something there to, um, to push him ever more into it. Um, there are other technologies that existed at the time as well. Put uh, voices in one's head and, and sounds in your head. No implant would be necessary. Direct transmission to the brain capability existed already by then. Uh, now, none of that may have been applicable in the death of McDonald. It could very well have been just that this man's career and life collapsed in the aftermath of the Condon Committee conclusions. And that is certainly a reasonable way to look at it. And uh, in view of the fact that we don't have any other evidence to the contrary, that's probably the safest conclusion, that his life just collapsed and he just got into a fit of depression and decided, what's the point? Despite the fact that he was a father of six children, uh, it's kind of a hard thing for me personally to put myself in that position uh, where suicide would actually be an option, but people are different. Uh, it could be, in other words, that he just felt overwhelmed by the situation. In any case, it is tragic. It's clearly a great tragedy. James McDonald was an inspiration, uh, not only to the people in his day, but to people who followed. Um, and I would say especially to many of us afterward, he's definitely an inspiration to myself. Uh, he showed that one person with intelligence, fearlessness, integrity can make a difference. Not, not the difference, all right? Not, not changing everything, all right? That's the problem that a lot of us have in our lives. It's like we want, we want to be able to make the big difference. We want to turn everything around so that all the problems go away. And I've got news for you. That's not what life does. Life doesn't work out that way, all right? But you can make a difference. James McDonald made a significant difference and made significant contributions to UFO research and to the culture in general. And there is a ripple effect that took years and actually generations, but it's there. It is there. So I, I would really uh, encourage all of you, you know, um, I mean, he paid dearly. He paid really the ultimate price for his commitment and for his failure failure of this great crescendo of the late 1960s that didn't happen. You know, a turning point at which we failed to turn was really what you could say happened with the UFO field. And, and McDonald took the real brunt of that. But I would simply um, add, as a great admirer of this man, that we've got to keep some perspective on our lives. Uh, every one of us, we have triumphs and we have failures. And that's just what life brings us. You know, 1,500 years ago or more, the uh, Roman, the last true Roman, I would say, Boethius, talked about the wheel of fortune. And he should know. He was at the top and he went to the bottom and, and died in a prison, beaten to death when he fell out of favor. Boethius said, you know, life, you can be at the top of the game one day and the very next day at the bottom. And that's how McDonald felt. But as Boethius said all those centuries ago, fortune is fickle. Fortuna is fickle, and you may be at the bottom one day, and things change. And what I would say to those of you 
we all talk to people who've had depression. We've all had depression. And I would really want to just remind those of you who sometimes feel overwhelmed by what's going on in your life or what's going on in the world. It's really true that tomorrow is another day. And when things seem their darkest, you've got to remember tomorrow is another day. It can always get better. And it will if you just got to, you've got to work at it. You've got to wait it out. And the next thing you know, the sun is shining. So for McDonald, he never got that. And that's the real tragedy is that we lost him for the next 20, 30 plus, however many years he would have lived. It would have been a tremendous, he could have lived into the 21st century. We could have had him. And my God, what a great benefit that would have been to have had James McDonald through the rest of the century into the 21st century, the age of the internet, it could have happened. And tragically, we lost him. Well, that's all I got. You want to come back, hang out? Yeah, for sure. All righty. I will move over for you. Okay, let's bring this over first. And we've got some uh, questions, people who want to yeah, follow first, up on this. I just want to uh, echo some comments that were happening there a little while ago where, you know, you dropped this bombshell on everyone. and But after the whole story, everybody was saying, you know, uh, an inspiration, definitely an inspiration, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why uh, I love that you're, you're going back and telling these stories and recognizing these characters. As I was saying at the beginning, like there's a whole new generation of people interested in this and they don't know about this stuff. And it's super important. So he's his someone, story they, is amazing. They could have done a movie like this. Yeah. He's the guy who really could be the subject of a great movie. Yeah. A great movie could be made about James McDonald. Yeah. 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 Um, I was listening to something Stanton Friedman had said earlier, and he definitely believed that his death was, in fact, a suicide. Mm -hmm. um, however, I love that you point out uh, what was going on at the time. People were asking, you know, was it MK Ultra? Um, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities, the, the and we really is, ultimately don't know. We but, don't know. That's the thing. But it we is don't suspicious. Know. I mean, you know, we're all saying, you know, yeah, it's it's suspicious. I mean, you got to wonder. Is this a candidate for suicide? I mean, okay, marital problems, but he's got six kids. Yeah. He's become world famous. Yeah. And yeah, he loses the UFO battle temporarily, but seriously, suicide over that, even suicide over some some jokers in Congress laughing at you. But like, it wasn't really? the first time they had been laughing at him, right? It wasn't like that just happened and he was being ridiculed all of a sudden. No, we had people then... like class going after him. It's true. Like he had people going out and it's hard on people, right? Yeah, but he had been resilient for some time, correct? Yes, I like, think so. I mean, uh, you know, now that I have a better understanding of class, mm -hmm. to to be able to be resilient when that guy's on your tail um, is to say something about how strong you are in your character. So it is kind of surprising that that something, I don't know, maybe it was the combination. Who knows? Philip J. Um, class was a truly mendacious human being. And skeptics, hardcore skeptics on this subject really should be um, embarrassed that class is one of their representatives like he's he's so he's such an embarrassment to any kind of genuine intellectual honesty like if you're a true ufo skeptic fine be a ufo skeptic but you should be embarrassed that philip j class is the number one representative for ufo skeptics well i think that's I mean, why why it's so important and so wonderful that uh james mcdonald came out and he was someone who was able to with his background and his profession to take down the stuff that class was saying. I think I think for the UFO community, this was the first time they really had someone who uh, could defend the field. He, he was. He was the first and best true first-rate scientist. He was like the pitfall. He was. He had all <laughs> the tools the that were necessary. Yeah. And, and he had the uh, public armor, you know, PhD with a uh, high prestigious university yeah. and all, all the attainments that you could ask for, he had it. And he decided he just, 1966, I'm John, he's like, I'm just doing this. And yeah. no one's gonna stop me. He goes in the right path, 
reads the blue book cases and realizes yeah. the emperor's not wearing any clothes. Right, right. Yeah, another thing, a uh, comment that Stanton Friedman made that I really liked, he, he was saying that uh, Heineck kind of got the notoriety, but he was, uh, but it was really James McDonald who was out there putting himself out there, really doing the work, really pushing things, really um, in people's faces, whereas Heineck yeah. was sort of, um not not so much you know he was kind of more in the background and but he was getting the notoriety so right. not to say anything bad about Heineck but just James McDonald was really this uh important character well earlier to be un known and understood in my first book I um I was very critical of Alan Heineck to be honest with you I mean I didn't like really tear into him excessively but I was very critical and in fact a number of uh researchers older researchers at the time were a little uneasy with the fact that I was so critical of Heineck um, and they thought I was a bit unfair and as I've gotten older I mean I don't I don't know I, I understand I feel like I understand where Heineck was coming oh from. Oh my gosh well you're going but, up against uh, the Air Force all the pressure. Yeah he was, he he was a team had. player absolutely, absolutely. Even if you, you know even if you're a really independent thinker and you want to tell the truth I mean I can't imagine all the pressures of authorities around you that would be, you know, corralling you. I, I can't imagine what that would be like. That, the social pressure, yeah, the cultural milieu mm -hmm. that he was in, the university world, all of that, I think, worked to basically keep Alan Heineck pretty well contained through the 1950s and most of the 60s until uh, McDonald basically shoved this in his face. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, McDonald's presence in the field in, in 1966 really was an embarrassment to Heineck. Mm -hmm. And Heineck, it took him a little while to kind of get over yeah. that. But he did eventually make himself a much more of a public. Um, and I think much more forthright. And Heineck wrote some very valuable things, you know, in the aftermath about Project Blue Book. Right. And he wrote a couple of books on this. And he he said essentially what McDonald had said. Yeah. Blue Book wasn't a genuine scientific investigation yeah. and it was and all of that. So that was very brave of him. Uh, to come out and say that in the end. Well, Heineck, yeah, but McDonald was the man who really was brave, and yeah, he was the one who still, actually prompted this. Heineck still was associated with all of those people. So, I mean, you know better than I do, but it seems to me right. it is still brave for him to come out and. and That's uh, true. He had relationships with those folks. Right. That's and right. So, anyhow, let's look right. at some of the questions here. Let me put my glasses on. Okay. So. Ken, I so enjoyed the first Blue Book episode. I wonder if the covert spy class activity surrounding and depicted in the show was any ring of truth. Richard. Oh, well. Oh, this, yeah, the covert spy class activity. I, I would say okay, uh, sorry, like, I had it broken up there. No and yes, and, and mostly no, but a little bit of yes. I mean, so what they did in the, in the series is to dramatize a lot of cloak and dagger, like X Files style uh, activities that are going on there. I mean, you have to expect that it's a TV show about UFOs and investigations, and so it's like X Files meets 1950s, yeah. and that's the Project Blue Book show. So that's there. But the real and, and Alan Heineck, it has to be said, uh, I'm not aware of any cases where he was engaged in like Fox Mulder style investigations. That's just is not the case. However, uh, I've said this before. What was true about the show is they did take certain things that were going on and they brought them all together um so for example there was russian espionage going on within the united states of course very much so in the 1950s um this was a significant issue and there was there's very strong evidence that there was russian interest in our ufo accounts as well mm -hmm. at least there's enough reason to assume that this was true mm -hmm. so that's fine to bring in. It's probably fair. Okay. Um, the Men in Black phenomenon was, uh, I don't know if they did that in the first episode. They I think did. they did. Yes, they, they did. did. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and then in other episodes. Men in that Hats. Can, they call them Men in Hats. Um, but it's the Men in Black. So Alan Hynek, to my knowledge, never had an MIB experience, but they brought that in and that's, that's fine. Um, what were some of the other things? Like car chase scenes. Okay. Not to Hynek. Um, but there were there were various types of odd um, 
cloak and dagger brushes with death that did occur to other people in that time period. One nearly happened to Kenneth Arnold, the pilot who saw the UFOs in 1947 when he was investigating uh, the Maury Island incident uh, later that year. Arnold, mm. by his own account, had someone tamper with his aircraft before he went to take off to fly home. And he, you know, was an experienced guy. So things like that happened. And in fact, Arnold himself had, um, uh, there was a, there was a, during the Maury Island case, uh, there was kind of a men in black situation that happened there. And so there were, this type of thing was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the paperclip connection, which doesn't happen in the Gorman episode, but that does come in the series. And I think it's fair to just say that they bring in a little bit of project paperclip. Um, and you, it's very easy to quibble with a paperclip connection to some of the connections that they make, but nonetheless, Project Paperclip, the import, importation of, of Nazi scientists, that was a real thing. And so they brought that in as well to give some historical flavor to it. And so, I mean, I think, you know, the if you're looking for literal exact truth, no, okay, mm -hmm. it's a series, it's for TV. Mm -hmm. But um, there isn't anything that I would say is like truly egregious. It's just, um, I, I don't know, my feeling is that they do it to kind of bring some historical things that happen and they kind of put them all together so you can see it in a nice coherent story with a with a plot arc a story arc and all that stuff that That's they, like, they gotta do yeah they gotta do that yeah okay so another question ken had was uh basically were hynex files ever available for project blue Book? um are they under lock and key were, were they available read... did anybody see them the best person to ask on this would be Jacques Vallée. Uh, Vallée wrote about this. Okay. And, we need um, Jacques Vallée. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we, uh, we chatted with him a, like a year or two ago, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. We saw him I at contact. Uh, yeah, Contact in the Desert. He was there. Um, yeah, Vallée wrote in, I think it was in Forbidden Science, because um, he knew Heineck very well, you know, mm. and he described Heineck's files as in a state of absolute chaos. Well, uh, uh, McDonald's files are described in the exact opposite way. Absolute perfection yeah, in their yeah. filing. Yeah. That seems right. Doesn't mean anything, yeah. but I mean. But Valet, I think, was uh, kind of amazed at, at these. I think he said somewhere in the book, like, how can Alan find anything in this <laughs> mess? Like, it was that, that kind of a thing. Um, so I don't know where Heineck's files are today. Okay. I, I, well, I will assume that they may be in Evanston, Illinois, or wherever the Center for UFO Study is currently, somewhere in Illinois, um, organized currently, but still by Mark Rodiger after all these years. I don't think they're doing a whole lot, but I, I'm going to guess that they have Hynex papers. Okay, thank you. Does Mr. Dolan uh, link the end of, of 60s attack on McDonald to end of NICAP and the split of APRO? Uh, well, APRO comes a little later, and I'm going to talk about that next week. but. Um, yeah, a lot of things happened at the end of 1969 and during that year. So NICAP uh, didn't end, but Kehoe was booted out of NICAP uh, in a kind of coup within the board. And that coup was organized by former CIA people led by Colonel Joseph Bryant primarily, um, who had been uh, high up, I think, head of the CIA's psychological warfare division back in the 50s. And here he is now in NICAP leading the charge to get Kehoe out of the directorship of NICAP mm. in 1969, just at the time, really, when Kehoe moves his focus away from the Air Force toward the CIA, mm. and they take him out. Mm. Now, <clears throat> so there's a lot to look at there. Now, the, the other side of it, is, and this is genuine, is that Kehoe was a not a good financial manager of NICAP. So NICAP was constantly in a state of begging for money, and it was getting kind of annoying to a lot of the NICAP members. Uh, toward the late 60s, Keo was putting out one desperate message after another to the NICAP members, like, we need money, we got to keep going. But, and so uh, I think people probably started wondering, like, uh, can you please rub a couple of nickels together here? Like, what is the deal yeah. with NICAP and money? And I don't know. I don't know why it was always so difficult like this, but it was true. So there's Definite financial management. There was the fact that the Condon Committee essentially debunked UFOs. That was a big hit for Keo, mm -hmm. and uh, and he was getting old. 
you know, he was getting up there. He was mm-hmm. not a young man anymore. So, mm-hmm. but it, it is true that the people who ousted him were CIA. It was not just um, Joseph Bryan. It was a man named uh, Jack Acuff, uh, who later ran NICAP. He was former CIA. And uh, Stuart Nixon was another one. Uh, they ran NICAP into the ground over yeah, the next 10 years. And NICAP just gave up the ghost. Um, it lasted until 1980, but it was it was wow. a nothing. There was nothing to NICAP uh, during the 70s except a salary for the uh, head of NICAP. He collected all the money and just lived off of it. Okay, just for some people who, if there's <clears throat> anyone here, a lot of people know what this is, but just for those who don't, can you just say what NICAP is just quickly? NICAP was... Uh, stood for National Investigation Committee for Aerial Phenomena, NICAP. It wasn't created by Donald Kehoe, but it was really ran by Kehoe nearly from the beginning in 1957. Uh, And for those 12 years that Kehoe ran it, it was, before there was MUFON, there was NICAP. NICAP really was the most prominent UFO organization, uh, civilian organization that there was. The second... The other one was APRO. I'll talk about them next week. They were very important indeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, APRO's files. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the, the head of APRO was a married couple named James and Laurel uh, Coral Lorenzen. Uh, Coral Lorenzen really was one, in my view, who was the intellect behind the organization. She wrote the books. Uh, she wrote good books. They died in the late 1980s, and, um, and the end of APRO is a real tragedy as well. Yes. Yes, uh, Richard was telling me more of the story this morning, and I'm saying you've got to do a show on this. It's so important. So I, I wrote about it in my second volume of UFOs, National Security State. If, you, if you've got a copy, you can read ahead, but uh, I'll talk about it next week. Okay, I've got a couple more questions, mm-hmm. but first of all, thank you, Mike. Mike, you are so good to us. But Mike Rossi. Mike Rossi. Mike Rossi. Is lighting up the house here. Thank you you so much. And thank you to everybody else too for the super chats, but it's not just super chats. Just thank you to everyone for being here. I just want to say this right now. It is so wonderful. People are tuning in from all over the world. We're we're not in the habit of like asking for contributions while we do this. And I, I really, I'm serious. Like I'm not wanting, I don't want people to think this is what we're about, but this is, this is actually how you support our research. It's how you support my research and allowing us to do this. Uh, This is all that we do. We, we don't do any, I don't, we don't have a day job. We don't go out and, and try to make well, a living any other this way. This is our so day job. This is it. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the good thing is that we get to focus yeah. literally every single day on mm-hmm. some aspect of the UFO phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And even in my prior years, when um, I've always been engaged, I had other occupations that I had to do to, to kind of make money and mm-hmm. get, uh, get the bills paid. And so this is our commitment now to do this full time. So we do appreciate your support. It's very, very much um, um, meaningful to us. Yes, and we will just want to quickly thank our members too. Uh, absolutely the same thing. We, we're so grateful. And uh, But we are dedicated to everyone, whether you are a member, someone who's able to do Super Chat or not. We are dedicated to getting a lot of free content out there for everyone. Yeah, and, and it's not necessarily like if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, that's great. If you yep. like the video, that's great. That's all we ask. So we appreciate it. We do. Any other questions? Yes. Um, let me see. If Mc- Kentucky Man wanted to know, if McDonald was a problem, why was he given a grant by the Navy? Well, that's a great question. See, first of all, the military is not some monolithic entity. Uh, McDonald had been in the Navy. He was in Navy intelligence during World War II. So there's no question he still had very positive relationships with the Navy. Secondly, uh, the Navy always has had especially back then, probably still now, a rivalry with the Air Force in a lot of ways. And they had a rivalry with the Air Force relating to UFOs. All right. This is a long-standing situation. It goes way back to even to the 40s. Um, And so it's really not surprising to me that McDonald could get the Navy to help him out. You know, in in NICAP, a lot of the leading board members of NICAP were Navy Navy men and admirals even. the Navy was always a very, yeah, had important officers who were very friendly to NICAP for many, many years. So there's always been these factions within the military, even within parts of the military that can give grant money out. Um, so I think McDonald obviously had an ally or two or three within the ONR's grant 
uh, research office. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stephen Early asked, uh, "Do you think the public at time at any time understood that Blue Book was not as was not serious?" Yes, I think uh, Blue Book was was actually even in the early '60s, long before the the crescendo of the mid '60s happened. I mean, people were making jokes in the newspapers and and whatnot about Project Blue Book. It was almost like a Tonight Show punchline. It could have been. Uh, you know, I think one uh, quip was, in the coming year, there will be uh, 500 UFO sightings and the Air Force will have 600 explanations. You know? yeah, right. Things like, like people all knew yeah. that Blue Book was really in that in the habit of explaining this stuff away. Um, you know, it was pre-internet, so memes didn't uh, travel around the country the way they would today, but there would have, I think, absolutely been lots of memes uh, about the Air Force and UFOs. I mean, we've, uh, you know, that reputation, that cliche mm -hmm. has lasted to this day, but it existed back then as well. Uh, now, there were also other people who were, you know, very patriotic and they believed in their military and they believed... Right. Um, you know, keep in mind, like it was a totally different world back then. Right, right. Uh, the world of 1960, those people, World War II was just a few years earlier. They right. fought this titanic struggle. McDonald himself was one such very patriotic person. Yeah, yes. Um, he wasn't out to like prove a conspiracy. Like he really wasn't. He was out to prove that this was a real scientific problem that deserved scientific inquiry. Yes, and uh, it was often said that he, he would never go to that conclusion first that the government was trying to cover anything up. He would always go to the conclusion that they just made a mistake and, yeah. that, and that they needed to apply uh, scientific means to these mistakes. And this is also an era, out, so. an era before people ever talked about Roswell right. and crash retrievals. Right. In other words, um, I mean, the Roswell event made the news like one day in 1947, and then it disappeared, and people really did forget about it. Like 99.999 mm. plus percent of the people forgot about Roswell. Right. And um, and McDonald was hard to imagine so right now. It is hard to imagine, <laughs> yeah. but but something like Roswell or crash retrievals changes the whole tenor of the cover up. Like if there's no such thing as crash retrievals, the Air Force or the, the government could could say plausibly. Um, yeah, we don't really know what this phenomenon is. It's elusive, blah, right. blah, blah. Um, if, however, so so in other words, in that situation, people like Hynek and others could say they were guilty of a foul up, not a cover up. And that's what they used to say. Mm -hmm. You know, they were guilty of being incompetent and 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 boobs, but not uh, but not of being devious. Right. But everything changes once there's evidence that something crashed and they recovered it. That right. changes it. Because right. then you can't pretend right, right. that we don't know what it is because you got something, you had hardware. And so with Roswell in the late 70s and through the 80s, when people started to realize, oh, this is, they can't say it was a foul up. That right. old argument doesn't wash anymore. Right. But that was, by then, uh, McDonald was long gone. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, Freethinker, why the name Blue Book? Great question. Do you know? Well, the word blue was used for a number of, uh, of classified activities relating to unknown aerial phenomena. Okay. Uh, and, and so I think Blue Book probably got the nomicker for that reason. Um, it's a good question, but I, I think that's probably why. Before that, it was, it was called Project Grudge. And before that was called Project Slot, uh, Sign, excuse me. It only became Blue Book in the spring of uh, 1952. So, uh, and then it, it remained in that until it was disbanded until 1969. But why? Yeah. 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 Okay. Was, yeah, that was a great question. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So you can pass on this for later if you choose. This is off topic. So, but some someone asked this, and it does represent a whole bunch of people. A lot of people have been asking this. Mm, okay. Um, wonder what you think of Clifford Stone. He has quite a lot of stories. Do you take him seriously? Mm. Uh, what is your opinion? And I know you've said, you know, 
you have some different opinions about that. Yeah, I want to. I have, I'll talk about Clifford. I've known him. I'm no, not. No. I'm not friends per se with Clifford, but we've always been friendly. And I did spend uh, at least one long. I spent a couple of days in his home. I visited him in Roswell, where he lives. I spent one long afternoon with Clifford. Um, he's. I have to just say, he's a sweetheart of a guy, an mm -hmm. absolutely sweet man. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a genuine um, tragic sadness that I mean he's had he's had ups and downs in his life and mm -hmm. he, you, he feel you feel it with him. Um, he also has possibly um, but not possibly definitely one of the most extensive file of uh, filing cabinet system of UFO I've heard documents that. I've heard like that. anywhere probably in the world. Like his entire house is filled filled with filing cabinets and he knows where everything is like he actually knows his stuff of massive amounts of ufo documents data that he has collected so as a student of the phenomenon he is uh actually top level okay so now he's got claims as well why is uh, he so polarizing like he is so polarizing well, in the community he's, so he's polarizing because he's he's had some claims that are very they're extreme claims. You mm -hmm. know, he made a claim that while in the army, he had a direct face-to-face -face encounter with an extraterrestrial that he allowed, he intentionally allowed to escape. He had telepathic communication mm -hmm. with it. Um, and so I'm not just saying, I'm not saying that that didn't happen, by the way. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a lot for some people to handle. And, um, you know, Wasn't he's he made, also the person who uh, brought forward the manual, the alleged manual of different extraterrestrials? That is Clifford, right? Um, wow. Um, if that was you him, and I I'm have not, talked about this before. Um, he's had he's brought he's had a lot of different manuals, and it's hard for me to keep track of which one is which. To be honest, I, with I you. yeah, so. I know. I, I'm I could have it mixed up as well, but I thought yeah, there was yeah, someone saying here. Uh, Clifford claims like 60 something species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that I think, wasn't it a is. medical manual or something like that? How you, I'm just watching what? I, I yeah, don't, I don't yeah. know. That probably, that's okay. probably true. And I wish that I had a more clear memory of that specifically. Uh, I'm just going to say Clifford actually provided me personally with some research assistance on some of the cases I was looking at for my first volume of UFOs in National Security State, particularly the, um, Thomas Mantell incident and the whole investigation of weather balloons and all that. He was actually incredibly helpful for me. Um, but some of the other ex claims, he, claims he's made, um, yeah, it's tough to know. One person wrote correctly that he was a featured whistleblower for Stephen Greer's organized conference in 2001, the National Press Club um, Disclosure Conference. Clifford Stone was there. Uh, my inclination is to probably believe Clifford Stone. Um, I, I think that I believe his integrity and I think I believe, I don't think he's a liar. Okay. I don't think he's a liar. But you I definitely, think, when you talk about it, when I've asked you about it in the past, you've always sounded tentative. Yeah, I am tentative. Yeah. I am because uh, it's, I don't know how to prove his claims. And so for that reason, it's, it's a bit it's of tough. an issue. It's tough. Yeah. Um, but hmm. I, I I don't think I've, I've talked with you about this, but I was in communication with a, a person who was trying to recently, I think, cultivate uh, communication with Clifford and at least, if nothing else, to try to get a kind of final, uh, I mean, I don't want to say final, final, but like a kind of a current statement mm -hmm. um, about a lot of things. And uh, I've, I've actually wondered about uh, reaching out to Clifford myself and uh, chat with him. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, there's there's things that like I don't know how how much value a conversation that I have with him would be if mm -hmm. I'm not able. I can't prove his can't verify uh, his experience. I think he said mm -hmm. it was 1969 when he had the ET encounter. And you know, what am I going to do with it? It's just yeah. like another story. Yeah, I understand. Okay, well, I think we should wrap up because this has been 90 minutes. 90 minutes. So uh, let's we just, gotta do this. Yeah, we do. So. 
any last things we want to tell people? Maybe we have a free newsletter. I'm sure most of you who are here know this. It's uh, You can find it on richarddolanmembers.com. It's right in the middle. Go there now. It's, it's free. After you're done with, with this. And it's a weekly summary of everything we put out, free content and members content. It has upcoming conferences and we are adding some new ones in for the year. So uh, that's Honestly, it's, it's a fantastic newsletter. I've just got to say, it's a great newsletter. You put it together every week. Uh, but it has a, there's a lot of information there and all the things that we do every week uh, and more actually and more is in that it's free. Go there, just subscribe. It's easy. And it's also, you know, if, if you've thought about being a member, but you're not really sure, uh, you can see what is being released for members every week. Uh, you can't necessarily go in and read it all, but, you know, you can sort of get a good <laughs> feel for what's happening because we have we have roughly about three posts a week. Um, I just did a, a breakdown. I listened to a, a YouTube uh, interview with uh, Jack Sarfati, uh, the brilliant and kind of uh, uh, controversial, I guess we could say, physicist, but absolutely brilliant, brilliant physicist. And he did a, an amazing breakdown of the physics of the Tic Tac UFO and metamaterials. Um, you can search it out on YouTube, but um, I listened to it and I, I wrote up my own uh, kind of notes and commentary on that. That's one of the things that we just did last mm -hmm. week. And mm -hmm. Richard does every Sunday, he does, I jokingly call it a fireside chat, but he does his weekly wrap up for members. So uh, any thoughts he's been having over the week, uh, people he's interviewed, things that, he, you know, that have been on your mind, uh, whether it's politics, UFOs, whatever, he sort of does this weekly wrap. And we also have uh, the Richard Dolan show, we do an additional segment uh, for members. And then there's other random things off the cuffs. I will sometimes record oh, yeah. him at breakfast in strange times where he goes off on his stories. <laughs> for members. You hear the breakfast he does it all the time. clanking so on the plate as it's I very easy. chew my eggs <laughs> and rant and bitch about something else. But also we uh, uh, we have a calendar on richarddolemembers.com that is free. You just go to the events tab and you can see, you can see everything we have there. Yeah. Um, one way you can support Richard's research that is free is just to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you're interested uh, and you missed this in the beginning, Richard has decided to do a short mini series right. on the cases featured in Project Blue Book. The series. The series. So that's going to be Saturdays. It's going to be live. And uh, if you want to know when it is, because it's not at a specific time, sign up for notifications on YouTube and uh, you'll get a notification when, when we go live. Yeah. So starting this week, I'll do the uh, the Gorman case from 1948, which is featured in the first episode of, of the Blue Book series. And I'll do my best to give a genu as genuine a historical accounting of the real case of the real case as I can. And if he lets us, I'll take some questions. Pursuing X and I will take some questions uh, that we'll try and Slip to him after. Maybe he'll answer a couple. Yeah, right, we'll see how that goes. So. But it was wonderful having you all. Wonderful seeing everybody here. Uh, we love Tuesdays, and uh, we hope you have a wonderful night. And Same we'll, here. We'll see you soon. And uh, listen, you know, like the story of James McDonald is a depressing story in a lot of ways, but it can be an inspirational story. And just remember, you know, we all deal with difficulties, and it's really important. Don't don't let those difficulties push you too far into depression. It's easy to, to happen sometimes. I understand that, but uh, as I said, tomorrow is always another day. And uh, had James McDonald lived, like, don't mm -hmm. you know, like things would have certainly been like really fantastic for him. He would he would have become a living legend. Yes. Uh, for the last decades of his life, and he lost that tragically. Yeah. So um, gotta hang in there. Things can get better. Things can always get worse, but they can always get better. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, All right. everyone. Later. Okay, good night.